Hey guys, welcome to Adam's podcast. This is uh, podcast number four, and we're talking about uh, the beginner self-defense series, concepts and philosophies, and all the other good stuff. So, uh, Adam. Hey. How's it going? Going good. Good. It's a nice sunny day. Nice 10 degrees. Good times. Good times. <laughs> okay. <laughs> all right. So uh, we got a few questions for you today. Let's, yes. Uh, Shoot. So let's start off. First one, I want to talk about the concept of less is more. Less, less is techniques more. equals yeah. more skill. Yeah, I tend to agree with that and I also disagree with that. So from the beginning, before your plateau, for example, less is more, right? Um, for example, you got a guy who's training for 60 minutes a day and he practiced 60 techniques. Well, he's only practicing one minute per technique, right? Get the same guy who practiced for 60 minutes a day, but he only practiced one technique. Well, he practiced that one technique for 60 minutes instead of one minute, so he's 60 times better. Of course, this is just math, so it's not taking into account a lot of other variables, but the general idea is there. If you're trying to get good at too many things, you're not going to get that good because it takes a large amount of repetition for the same movement in order for your nervous system to be able to do it with both thought. Just to get the general idea, right? You can't be thinking about how you're moving when you're focusing on how the other guy is attacking you. You can only focus on one thing at a time, right? So your movements has to be pre-programmed. What that means is you have to do it over and over and over and over again until it's second nature. And in the process of that, you're constantly making adjustment and modification based on your body type and your temperament and how you naturally want to move. So if you focus on too many things, what would happen is you're not going to get good at it because you don't have enough repetition per movement. So now you have to think before you move and your body's not used to the movement and you haven't given yourself a chance to make adjustment to have functional speed and power in every single movement you do. It's not about how many techniques you know, it's about how good your techniques are. Is it fast? Is it powerful? Is it balanced? Is it coordinated? Is it accurate? Do you have natural follow-ups with those movements? Is it actually a weapon, or are you just moving your limbs around, right? If you move on a guy with blinding speed, functional power, a lot of accuracy, density of weapon, well-balanced, natural sensitivity in your weapons, ability to follow up with both thought. If you can do that, that's an extremely hard technique to deal with. Look at Western boxing. They only have five punches. And it's some defense. They got cover, they got parry, they got scoop, they got shoulder roll, they got bob and weave, they got shielding. There's not that much material in boxing. But if you fight a professional boxer, most martial artists will lose, right? Even though they know more techniques. That's very different in the martial art industry, which has largely become like a middle class hobby, right? Where people want something new every two seconds. So they're never going to really get good at it. But that's okay because it's a hobby. But this podcast is about people that actually want to learn to become functional, to be able to actually use this stuff in a real situation, right? So less is more, definitely. But I also disagree with that. Once you get to a certain level and you have a small list of things that you're trying to get good at and you have already, um, I hate this word, but you have already mastered. In truth, you can't master anything, but you have already gotten really good at it, right? You have plateau in it. So now it's time to add more, to find new ways of doing things, right? I think it was Einstein that said, it's kind of stupid to expect a different result if you're doing the same thing. So even though you're doing the same movement, there's a certain time that you should learn how to do something new. You add more to the list, right? Most of the time, you would not have to do that if you can just modify what you're already doing and you find a new variation. But sometimes you have to completely shift paradigm. For example, a lot of guys practice empty hand fighting, right? If you look at the criminal statistics, a lot of serious crime, most serious crime, happen with a weapon, right? A lot of empty hand stuff simply would not translate that well. And of course, people will argue about this, but arguing is one thing, but very few martial artists can handle a guy charging at him with a knife, for example, for real, right? So now you have to um, completely shift paradigm and learn something new. And it's really hard for a lot of people to learn something new once they get good at something because their pride takes over. They don't want to put on the white belt again, so to speak, right? That's why before we learn to how to even stand in martial art, before any basic skill, traditionally we're taught to bow. Why? To teach us humility and open-mindedness, right? That's really a, um, very important if we don't abuse it. Of course, if we abuse it, it becomes dogma and then it's terrible. So as a good teacher, you have to kind of find a balance point and th these are some things that people should really um, keep in mind when they're training. 
Um, I'm sidetracking a little bit, sorry. So, so for the beginner, just focus on a few things and do it a lot. That's the best way to sum it up. Yeah. All right. There was also a, a mention of um, kind of the old school way of uh, doing mass repetitions as a way to weed out students that are not really serious about training. Oh yeah, like boxing gyms, wrestling, uh, old wrestling places, a lot of old school places still do that. That's excellent, right? And, it, and that really depends on the agenda of the teacher. I mean, if you're opening a school and teaching so you can make money and turn your school into a cash cow, <laughs> then obviously you don't want to do that, right? I mean, I remember Jesse was telling me, you don't want to make people sweat too much. You don't want to make them work too hard, right? If you're doing a public thing, and that's why he never liked doing a public thing. But if you're actually training people to make them good, then mass repetition is necessary to program skill. And of course, in the process of that, naturally you'll weed out a lot of people that are not serious, right? And that's very important for your student that wants to get good, because if you weed out everybody that's not serious, now the only people that's left is actually people you can train with and get good. Now you've built a very, very strong school, right? But that's very rare in today's uh, commercialized environment, you know what I mean? Right. And, uh, but yeah, that's a very good way to clean up your school, yeah. Cool. Yeah. Okay, so let's move on to another uh, question. Uh, this one's about sharing combat information and showing off. <laughs> yeah, yeah, showing off, yeah. Well, we live in, that's the culture we live in, right? Now people, even when they go to have a meal, they want to take a picture and put it on Facebook, right? <laughs> they want people to know everything about them, right? So that, that's natural for people that grew up in this age, but martial arts are a little bit different. We live in an age of, uh, you know, sharing is caring. I completely agree with that. Um, even in martial arts, right? However, if you're talking about self-defense, if you're talking about combat, not just martial arts as a hobby, if you're talking about doing it in a way that works in a real situation, then the old rule still applies of you shouldn't share it too much, right? Sun Tzu, the art of war, he says, let your plans be as dark as night. Strike without warning like a thunderbolt. To put it more... Miley and in modern terms, Jesse, quote, I quote him and he once said, you got to be a fool to do something on somebody over and over and over again and not expect him to come up with an effective encounter, like counter for it, right? To use another example, look at the Gracie family, right? They started the UFC, they challenged the entire world, they picked a fight and they beat everybody in UFC 1, 2 and 3. What happened was people started to adjust to what they're doing because they were dumb enough to show everybody what they were doing, and the whole family lost, right? And they're kind of like not in the, now turned to MMA, right? But they made a huge contribution to the MMA world, so I'm not knocking them, but I'm saying, if that's why the military never shared their intel with other countries. No military art will share what they're gonna do with other country, right? So this kind of exists in tribal arts, especially blade arts. In the old days, you don't really share what you do with other people because it's dumb. If you're using this as a survival system and you're constantly showing people what you're going to do, you're showing your enemies what you will do to them, that's not smart, right? And that rules apply if you're doing your stuff for actual combat. This does not apply if you're doing martial arts as a hobby, if you're doing it as a way of losing weight, if you're doing it uh, for a sport, if you're doing it to spar with your friends in a weekend to feel good. Now this doesn't apply. But if you're doing it as a combative art to save your family, for home evasion, for rape, for self-defense, now you don't want to go around showing people what you're doing because they're going to find a way to get around it quite easily. Everything's beatable. Everything has an inherited weakness if you're dumb enough to show people what it is. That's just common sense. That's why that's the first rule in military arts or the art of war, right? Second thing that is wrong with always showing off all the time, like you're walking around town and you get this martial art t-shirt on, touch me in your first lessons free kind of thing. <laughs> well, now this guy's going to pick a fight with you. He was going to attack you with his hands, right? But you have a reputation always going around telling people how tough you are, that you do more short, whatever. Now they're going to jump you with five guys with a weapon. It was going to be a one-on-one -on -one fight, but because you have a reputation, now it's going to be five guys coming at you with a weapon. People are not stupid, right? So you're attracting trouble. Basically showing off, you have made yourself a target, right? People, it's like the old gunslinger kind of mentality. That's not that common nowadays, but it still exists. There are people that enjoy violence and they enjoy a challenge. Don't make yourself a challenge, but don't make yourself a victim. There's a fine line between the two, right? The way I'm talking and what I'm talking about is not really in the modern culture, right? But it does exist in the criminal culture. So if you want to, you want to start to work against criminals, you have to understand some different lines of thinking compared to social normality, right? Yeah. That's important in martial art. 
if you choose to use it martially. So bottom line, be humble, no matter how good you are. Yeah, and keep a low profile and stop showing, stop showing up, right? Yeah. Right. I do. That's why, like, you know, I'm online. I'm I'm sharing my short stuff, sure. And but like most traditional teachers, um, you have what you share publicly, and you have what you practice privately with uh, family members and actual students, and they're not the same thing. They're different programs for a reason, right? Right. So yeah. All right. Okay. Um, which actually this goes into the third questions we had, which mm -hmm. has to do with uh, talking. Everyone yeah. loves talking, especially while they're training. They like to explain to each other how yeah. to do things and so on. Well, last week I was teaching a class. That's a good example. I was trying to. This guy asked me a question, and I was trying to. He said, "Hey, how do you do this better?" And I wanted to show him how to do it better, so I started showing him, but. I couldn't even finish my sentence without him telling me what he would do and what he had learned before and why he thinks it's awesome, even though it doesn't work. So he's doing something, it doesn't work. Then he asked me how to improve it. I'm trying to tell him, but he interrupts me and tells me what he thinks of what his expert advice is, even though he just said it doesn't work. So that's a very weird illogical way of learning that is very popular in today's culture where people see themselves as a client and not as a student, right? I got the same time as an expert. <laughs> yeah, it's kind of like you go to a doctor's office and sometimes you hear doctors complaining nowadays that patients will argue with them because they Google something, right? Yeah, <laughs> Even yeah. though they never went to med school, right? So that's very common, especially on the internet nowadays. So as a learning curve, my advice to students is if you actually want to get good, stop talking, start training. If you got time to debate, Oh, yeah, I think this works. No, screw you. I think that works. You're debating with your classmate. If you got time to debate, you got time to test it. If you got time to debate, you got time to put on the helmet and the gloves and go at it. You can find out the answer in two seconds, right? You have to take the scientific approach. And a scientific mentality is look, your opinion doesn't matter, debate doesn't matter. What matters is repeatable, proven test results. Early on on your student's journey, you should introduce them to that pragmatic idea of testing things and proving things, relying on science instead of relying on like an internet Styles pissing contest or arguing or debating and the ego stuff, right? Mm -hmm. and we, yeah. yeah, and that helps them with their life because instead of getting stressed out about opinions, like you just test things. That sounds really like, sounds like common sense, but it's not common anymore, right? So we have to make sure we put that in our training programs. So stop talking, start training. Start training and start testing. And testing. And then after you test, now you qualify to talk, dissect, analyze, reflect, and modify. Any talking before the test is just kind of BS, right? Theory, yeah. Yeah, You're so sitting there, all but if you test it, yeah. then you go back. So you think before you train, you think after you train. You don't think while you're training. Just, you know. Yeah. All right. Okay. Yeah. So one last thing. Yeah. Um, is this idea of self-defense and why you do it. Mm -hmm. uh, a lot of people do it, like you said, for a hobby. Yeah. You know, trying to lose weight, trying to get in shape. Um, yeah. And a lot of some people do it for fear because they're afraid that they're going to get jumped for the families. Yep, and so that's on. the primary reason. Um, most people that are serious about using this combatively, and definitely of all the martial arts I've met, the ones that are actually functional in an actual combative situation. Not a sport. Um, not a sparring match, not games. I'm talking about like home evasions, uh, carjacking, hostage situation, a group attack, a knife attack, a gun attack, like an actual life and death situation, a combative situation. It's a very small percentage. Of all the martial arts I met, I probably can count on one hand the guys that are actually scary and actually functional in a combat situation. These masters or teachers I've met, all of them without exception, has been a victim before. You can't teach that, and I don't want to teach that, and I don't wish that on anybody, right? So fear is a large, beginning, motivational learning factor, right? If you get a guy that's very serious about combat, nine times out of ten, he has suffered some trauma before, some abuse. And that's very, very unfortunate. And But he's going to be very different than someone that basically think a fight is a UFC match or some Hollywood movie or... For him, is ego. For him, is voluntary violence. He's volunteering for violence to feel better about himself. A victim has a different mentality. 
is involuntary violence. You're pushing this on him. You're cornering him. You're forcing him. He doesn't want to fight, but he has no choice. You're cornering an animal. That's a different mentality altogether than someone that's just fighting to feel good, right? So if someone has that fear mentality, that past trauma, if they learn competence, he's going to learn a lot faster than someone that's treating it as a hobby, right? right. So learning how to process that fear. A lot of times people have that fear, they learn how to fight, and they are, they are still just as scared as they want. Because even though they have healed their body, they haven't healed their mind, so to speak. You give them a tool to survive balance, but deep inside he's still scared of the world, how he relates to it. A lot of combative instructors that I've met are actually very scary people deep inside, right? Because of what happened to him as a child. So, you know, when you're training, obviously it's good to get professional help from therapists and counselors and so forth, but even as a martial artist, when you're training, if you acknowledge that fear, and that's very important to acknowledge that fear, you progressively learn to overcome it, right? Not through positive thinking, not through rage, not through just mere competence and confidence, but actually learning to relax under pressure. Normally, you got to learn to relax, because fear and tension, they're the same thing. You're manifesting your body through tension at all times. You have to learn how to relax when you fight. Aside from the fact that relaxing actually makes you fight a lot better, but psychologically, you got to learn how to release all that fear progressively. This is a long journey, right? Learning, teaching someone how to fight well is very easy, and it's pretty quick, if he's serious. But getting someone to rewire their brain to be less scared and change the way you relate to the world to become a better person, to heal, that, that takes a long time. And that is the ultimate goal. That is the goal of, uh, in my opinion, of what martial is. It's not just about fighting. If efficiency is all you want, buy a gun. It works a lot better than martial art. Right? I'm not advocating people go out and buy a gun, I'm just using that as an example right, of logic. But martial art has a way to make you very, very, very confident. Not because you can fight, but because you have handled your own fear through the medium of violence, which people just don't face nowadays. Right? If you can handle facing violence, you're forced to look at your own fear. You can't do one without the other. And if you're forced to look at your own fear, then slowly maybe you'll have a chance to overcome it by relaxing, not by tensing up and psyching yourself up. Right? If you don't look at your fear, you'll never cure it. You have to first acknowledge it and face it and embrace it and slowly relax into it, engage it, then release it. Right? Now, people don't want to do that. They don't want to seem like a, excuse my language, they don't want, they don't want to ex seem like a pussy, right? They yeah. want to act tough. They want to get big bicep, wear a martial art badass t-shirt, touch me in your first lesson is free bullshit. Argue about my teacher is better than yours. All that crap. That's all ego. The more egotistical you are, you don't want to acknowledge your fear. You don't want to seem like a pussy. That means you'll never be cured. Because you, you don't even want to admit you're scared. So that's why we're learning about. That's why we have talks and discussion after class. It's okay. There's no shame. You have to first admit you are scared. And then slowly, now you can engage it, and now you can release it and overcome it. That's a healing process that's very important. And it's not fluffy. You can't fluff it. You have to face your fear. That guy's punching me in the head. I am scared. Now i got to learn how to relax. That guy's punching me in the head. Oh, I beat him, but I was tense. I was still scared. So really, I still lost. How do I beat the enemy within? That is the only worthy enemy, right? Yeah. Right on. Food for thought, right? Yeah. <laughs> sorry, I, sorry, I went off. Went no, again. it's all good. It's uh, yeah. very, very good stuff. Yeah. Okay, guys. So uh, that's it for today. Uh, thanks for tuning in. Yeah. <laughs> and uh, again, as you guys know, we got a website, pragmaticmartialarts.com. Uh, there's many training videos on there. Go check it out. You could do. Uh, you could try it out for seven days for free and see how you like it. All right. So we'll see you next time.